Shalom Uvraha. Peace and blessing. Welcome to Monday School. I invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> Pardon me. Revelation 19, we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 16. Before we go any further, would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this day, for every reminder that we have as we look at your creation, that you are the great and mighty one, that your creation is uh, beyond our ability to comprehend as far as its detail, its intricacy, that there are some things that you have made simple on purpose and other things that are so complex that they're beyond our ability to imagine. And yet it is all intended to direct us to look to you. And so it is, as we study your word, that we look to you. As we do, we'd like to remember before you those of our friends and colleagues who need a special touch from above. We ask your hand would be upon Michael. Um, give him that touch. Meet him at his point of need. We ask your blessing upon Jean, that you would encourage and help her. And for Barbara, your healing touch, the touch that you alone can give. Um, and we ask that uh, for Tina's friend that has all these stints and some issues with them that you, oh Lord, would bring about healing. We ask your hand upon our church, upon Pastor Joe. We ask that you would enable us to, to worship you in a manner that befits your glory. Help us to sing and praise with all our hearts not just in the sanctuary, but wherever we are along life's path. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Revelation chapter 19, starting with verse 4. And we're going to be working our way through to verse 16. Now, before we get there, before we start in chapter 19, I want to remind you, and if you go back and read this, you'll find that in chapter 18, judgment has fallen upon Babylon. And it is thought that it is most likely this is John's way of referring to Rome, that he is comparing Rome to Babylon. Because by the time John has written this, Babylon is a distant memory. So, here we are, Revelation 19, starting with verse 4. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, Hallelujah. 
you know, we have met in times past, we have met these 24 elders and the four living creatures that surround the throne. And we frequently encounter them in acts of worship, extolling the virtues of God and uh, lifting up, exalting his name. And this is no different. And they are worshiping God who was seated on the throne. And the words they cry out, <clears throat> pardon me, two words in Hebrew that we encounter frequently that they have been transliterated into English so that you hear people use amen and hallelujah, <clears throat> sometimes in a worship setting and sometimes in a, in a casual uh, non-worship setting, mainly because a lot of people don't understand what the words mean. Amen means so be it, or let it, let it come to pass. And uh, I think it makes you wonder sometimes if maybe the Beatles were listening in because it's sort of along the lines of let it be, let it be so, bring it about. And what is it that they want brought about it's God's will that they are worshiping God Almighty and they want his will to be done. And of course, hallelujah, again, a transliteration that in Hebrew, it means praise the Lord. And so you will find in some translations of this passage, it will say exactly that, praise the Lord. And in other words, they choose to stick with the Hebrew word, hallelujah. So, verse five. Then a voice came from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him both great and small. A voice coming from the throne. But it's clear that it's not the one who is sitting on the throne, whose voice we hear, because we know the one sitting on the throne is God. But we read here that the voice came from the throne saying, praise our God. Obviously, the God of the 24 elders, the God of the four uh, creatures, living creatures, the God presumably of all of those who are gathered around the throne, and of the speaker himself. God is his God as well. And from that, we surmise that the voice is that of the Son, that Jesus is speaking forth, calling out praise to his God and Father. Praise our God, all you his serpents, you who fear him, both great and small, that he is making it clear that the praise of God is not for one uh, group that may have a limited membership. It's not for the rich and famous, nor is it for the poor and downcast it is for the great and small. The way is open.
for all to fear him. Verse 6, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, shouting, Hallelujah, back to that word, for our Lord, God Almighty, reigns. So here is this great multitude. And from previous reading, we are to understand this is millions multiplied. And that the sound of their voices, I don't know if you've ever been in a big crowd, but even if it's only 50,000, when everybody starts saying something at the same time, it, it sounds like a roar. It's indistinguishable. You can't say, tell what is being said, but it is a roar like that of rushing water, perhaps even like peals of thunder. Something that gets your attention and clearly, this got John's attention. And the shouting was declaring the praise of God, hallelujah. And why is it that he is praising God? For our Lord, God Almighty, reigns. That God is on the throne. And that is cause for celebration. Verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now, when we think of a bride... We seldom think of somebody who's thrown on the nearest pair of denim jeans and a t-shirt in preparation for the wedding. She is r rather dressed in her finery and she is prepared for the, uh, for the bridegroom to see her and to be enthralled. And so as this time is approaching, we're told once again to rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Who? For the wedding of the Lamb has come. So give all glory to the Lamb. I'll remind you, John the Baptist, when Jesus came upon the scene at the time of his baptism, John the Baptist took one look at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Rejoice, for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And historically and biblically, the bride of the Lamb is the church. And let's go on reading. Verse 8 says, Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her, to wear. And that doesn't need a lot of explanation, but John feels compelled to tell us fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. When God's people 
act like God's holy people. They clothe the church in a way that elevates everybody's view, everybody's insights as to who the Lamb is and what he wants to accomplish. Verse 8. Then the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the words. These are, excuse me, these are the true words of God. So blessed are those who are invited to the wedding, the wedding supper of the Lamb. So the, the blessing, and by the way, this is sort of a beatitude, if you will, but unlike those of, that we're used to in Matthew's gospel, this beatitude speaks of a celestial event that is going to be beyond our imagination and that the blessing rests upon those who are invited. And who is invited? The word tells us, whosoever will may come. And of course, among scriptures that we are extremely familiar with, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that everlasting life is to be lived out in light of the the wedding of the Lamb and the wedding supper of the Lamb to which they have been invited. And he added, the angel added, these are the true words of God. And John's response, and he has this sort of response several times, but John's response is, Verse 10, at this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, this angel is making it clear. Apparently, he is stunning in his appearance to the point where John finds him worthy of worship. But the angel stops him saying, I am a fellow servant with you. So, brothers and sisters, just remember, you are fellow servants with angelic beings. Now, the angels, and we have our idea of what is constituted in being an angel, but remember that the word means messenger. So angels are about the business of proclaiming God's message to whoever has not heard. In the same way that he is declaring that they should rejoice over the wedding supper of the Lamb, and as he is proclaiming words that the bride should make herself ready 
By the way, if you ever wonder, what is it that I need to be doing? In order to glorify God, I need to be preparing to be a worthy participant in the wedding supper of the Lamb. So, I fell at his feet and worshipped him, but he said, don't do that. I am a fellow servant. And so, you and I are servants. This angelic being is a servant. We are joint servants in the service of Almighty God. And that he considers himself, this angel, to be a fellow servant with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. I guess it doesn't require a lot of explanation to say hold to the testimony of Jesus. There's nothing more than Satan wants you to do than to, to throw away your testimony, to discard your testimony. Or, even worse, if you hold your testimony, but you're not living in harmony with it. So to hold your testimony, you live in harmony with all that God has called you to do. Hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. He's giving further instruction. How do you want to be sure that you are there for the wedding supper of the Lamb? Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. And that spirit of prophecy you know, remember that prophecy is is not foretelling as much as it is forthtelling proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and so that uh, it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus, the spirit that is is about the proclamation that that is is busy with the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And that is who we are called to work in concert with. Verse eleven: I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse a symbol of victory in the Roman world, that the uh, victor, the conquering king, always rode into a vanquished city riding a white horse. And so, heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called faithful, and true. These words that speak of who Jesus is and what he has done. He has been faithful in every respect to the call of God. And he has been true in all that he has taught us. With justice, he judges and wages war. There's no such thing as an unjust war or battle when Jesus is the one on the battlefield. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. When it speaks of his eyes being like blazing fire or like flames of fire, I'm reminded of the opening of the book of Revelation. And I want to read to you now from verse 14. 
that of chapter one, and it's describing Jesus, it says the hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. This is in chapter one. Chapter two, verse 18. And to the angel of the Lord, or excuse me, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. It is this same Jesus that is on the scene as we work through this passage. His eyes are like blazing fire, verse 12, and on his head were many crowns. You recall the song, Crown Him With Many Crowns, right? That the crown is a symbol of authority in a particular kingdom. And when it says he is crowned with many crowns, it says that he is the king of many kingdoms. On his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. And we're not even told later exactly what this name is. That's left for us to experience in a future that is yet to be completely revealed to us. Verse 13, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. Isn't that interesting? The bride is supposed to be adorned in fine linen. And now we have uh, an army on white horses like unto that of their king. And they are dressed in fine linen, white and clean. That's not exactly battle garb, is it? That's an indication that here we have mounted on horses that symbolize total victory. We have mounted the bride, the church. Coming out of his mouth, that of Jesus, is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. And the word that is translated rule here is actually a verb, not the noun shepherd, but the verb, that he will shepherd them with an iron scepter. And the idea is that he has the power, the capacity to rule in a way that is, is rugged and almost unthinkably stern. But that he is not ruling them as an earthly tyrant, but that he is shepherding them while carrying all the power, all the symbolic power that he needs to demonstrate that he is truly in charge. And you might have noticed 
I didn't spend time on it. It says he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And we've seen earlier that he is in a white robe. But he is in a robe dipped in blood. And how is it that that happens? The final verse of this passage, it says, He treads the winepress of the fury of God Almighty. That the wine press was the place where the grapes, the ripest grapes, were squeezed to release their juice to be made into the finest of wines. And Jesus is here treading the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty that he is making this living illustration that those who have opposed him will be crushed. But whatever sweetness might be extracted from what they could have been is, is being extracted here in the wine press of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the passage that George Friedrich Handel had in mind when he penned what has come to be known as the Hallelujah Chorus. He shall reign forever and ever, and his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting King, Prince of Peace. And he shall reign forever and ever, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That the point of that combination of words, who is in charge of a king? And we are told clearly that Jesus Christ is king over all kings. And who is Lord in a royal setting? That who, who is in control over the Lord of the manor? It's his. He is in charge. And so the Lord of Lords is the one to whom all lords bow. The King of Kings is the one to whom all kings bow. And it is this one to whom we all bow our knee, every knee shall confess, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, King of kings, Lord of lords. Amen. Amen.